think I'm about to get some assistance, which would be great. Just while we're doing that, um, I should just say thank you very much to um, Vivian and Dre. Vivian? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Uh, and Vivian's been intimate in getting this organised and working very closely with Helen Spateras as well. Um, just a bit of prelude to what the slides will pop up in a minute. So uh, some months ago, there came an opportunity, which was going to be in November for us to talk about fire. Uh, we had an interesting coalition of people going to be in Melbourne at the same time, including Graham, who you'll hear from in a little while. Um, unfortunately, through illness and a few other things that, uh, that fell through, but we um, are having a take two tonight. Um, you'll hear more about this in a little while. Okay, but uh, words you've already heard tonight, like uh, EMR, like data, like data sharing, like analytics. Fire is something that's critical to those things being successful moving forward. Um, if you haven't heard about this and Graham's work uh, before tonight, then I'm sure this will stimulate you to investigate further. If you have, you will acknowledge it's a great opportunity to hear from, from Graham, who's very <laughs> intimate in this work. Um, so a little bit about why it's relevant to health service and clinicians. Firstly, what is it? Uh, FIRE, in essence, is a brand new interoperability standard, data exchange standard. So it's not a piece of technology, okay? If you've heard of the organisation called HL7, it's intimate to your hospital systems, which you may not realise. So data going from your PAS system to your laboratory system to your EMR is all premised on HL7 messaging. And Graham is probably cringing with the thought of how well that doesn't work. Um, but the same body in, a national in an international sense, the same standards organisation sort of oversees this work. Graham and his team have been intimate and his community have been intimate in bringing this to reality. Um, important to note that um, some of the largest EMR vendors in the world have embraced this technology or this approach and have been intimate in driving it forwards. So for those who work at Royal Children's Hospital, EPIC have been intimate in this. For those of us in the East Melbourne, Cerner have been intimate in this. Apple have been intimate in this. Google, Amazon and various others, and we could talk for a long time about why they've embraced this new approach and why it's been so successful. Um, what you're seeing there is um, an app orchard under the branding of EPIC. So you can go in there and find nifty little apps that will interact with the EMR system. And FIRE has been intimate in allowing those things to actually happen, okay? Um, another example. So on the left there, an Australian product now bought up by an American company called DoseMe. Apart from Stephen, has anyone else heard of DoseMe? So a handful, okay. So what we're talking about with this particular technology is individualised um, dose suggestion, if you like, based on some complex pharmacokinetic modelling. So the technology that does that can be accessed from within your EMR system, from within your CERN system. And so no longer do we have to use intelligent guesswork about the next dose of gentamicin or the next dose of warfarin, because this kind of technology pulls data from the EMR, pulls the prescribing history to date, calculates and advises you about what to do next. Okay, very bespoke, very niche, but external parties who aren't the vendors, excuse me, can build that. Okay. Another example, uh, this case is the cardiovascular risk calculator. So if you're interested in this from a clinical usability point of view, I'd encourage you to go and see what's in the, in the uh, Epic app or should see what's in the Cerner app store. You'll get a flavour for the whole range of things that the approach around fire has allowed to occur. These are real. They're just not here so much. They're very real. They exist. They're in use. Okay. And importantly, our big vendors have played with this and in theory support it. Okay. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So, a bit more about Graham. Uh, Graham Grieve is principal at Health Intersections, which is Graham's consulting company. He was originally a clinical biochemist, so he's come from on the ground in healthcare. He's certainly in our sphere of influence, our, our sort of informatics world, been a very long time well known expert on health IT and interoperability. Um, his official title is the Fire Product Director for HL7 International when it comes to fire work colloquially known as the father of fire. I've never actually asked Graham if he minds that. Um, <laughs> take it or leave it. It's better, it's better than the Chinese calling me the grandfather of fire. 
<laughs> very good. All right. As you can see, Graham's a very humble, practical man, and we're very uh, delighted to have him come and speak to us tonight. Um, importantly, too, um, just last year, he won an award called the John Glazer uh, Award. I'm not sure people know who John Glazer is. If you're in informatics, you recognise the name. So, originally a health CIO, I think he's now a CMIO of CERN still. Yeah. yeah, okay, that happened about two years ago. Uh, so there's an award struck up in his name. Uh, a previous winner, a guy by the name of David Bates, who many more in healthcare would acknowledge from a quality and safety point of view. So only three awards so far, I think, and Graham's the third one. Um, with that, I'll ask Graham to come up and uh, please join me in welcoming him. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is, is a bit of a hybrid. I want to explain to you why fire is potentially a big deal. I also want to explain, to try and explain that, I want to talk about my personal motivation and, and story behind that. And what I want to do is convince you that this is not some sort of theoretical thing. I mean, it is, and it's really, really a long way down under the covers, but that it's actually pretty significant. So, so I want to talk about why we started doing this. So I started working on fire in 2011. And, and this is, this slide hasn't changed in all that time. We recognize from working in healthcare that healthcare has broken processes. There's, there's parts that work really well and there's many, many practitioners, no doubt all of you in the room, who work really hard and really well. But I remember being in the hospital and watching the chaos. And although I don't work in a hospital anymore, I consult and I still hear about the chaos. And also I observed that everybody's responsible for a part of the system and aims to run their part at world-class standards and works really hard on that. But Nobody's got the same accountability for the overall system of systems and the outcomes. And there's lots and lots of practical reasons why that is not really feasible at the moment. But when you see the system as a patient, and I engage as a patient or more, more um, practically at the moment, although my time will come, when my family engages with the system as a patient, then you realize just how big the gap is between where we could be and where we are. And it's the same all over the world. I, I have the pleasure, dubious pleasure, but of traveling. I've done 30 countries in the last two years. I hear the same stories all over the world. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Russia or you're in Vietnam or you're in USA or Canada or I haven't, I haven't talked to Japan, I admit that. But it's the same story. It's, this is hard work. And I also started with the observation that healthcare does not have good support from IT. And I want to say right now, IT is a terrible misnomer. I'm just, I'm not interested in technology. I don't do technology. What I do is information management. I am. And, and I don't, we're, this whole focus of what I'm talking about here is managing information, not technology. But, but everybody calls it technology, even though it's a misnomer and misleading and because we call IT, it's IT, it's hammered into us. I will keep using words IT, but actually I'm interested in information management. And, and the combination of communications technology and information management has transformed um, the processes in other industries to considerable disruption. But we also know that change is really hard in healthcare. Um, the IT, the information support, is just not enabling healthcare the way it should. So I actually, so I worked in St. Vincent's Hospital in the lab. Then I went and worked in a clinical team as a um, science, bench scientist, supporting the clinical team, spent quite a bit of time in the hospital uh, at St. Vincent's Institute of Medical Research back when that existed. And then um, I got offered a job by a computer company and at the same time, my scholar, my research funding was running out. So I jumped ship and I said, I remember saying to my supervisor, 
he was not very happy that I was jumping out of research, but there was such a thing as a research funding round. But he, he expressed to me his unhappiness. And I said, what I want to do is actually fix healthcare IT. <laughs> I had no idea how big a job that is. But by mostly by a whole bunch of luck, I stumbled into actually doing it. Um, if I had any idea what I was doing, I would have known that I shouldn't do it. But we did, and so did that. So I want to be clear, and I'll come back to this later, there's heaps of problems, and IT is just one of them. And solving IT won't solve clinical problems, right? I'm clear about that right now. But, but there's a whole bunch of things you need to do to solve clinical problems you can't do because you don't have information managed the right way. So what we think of it as if we can get the information right, we can get out of the way of solving the actual problems. So that's our goal, is just to get out of the way. It's a very small goal, but also very big at a different level. So really, fire is not really a very actual clever idea. It was an idea whose time had come. I said, given that we have the right relationships, but we have the wrong technology and the wrong methodology, let's just use those relationships to build fire which is two different things like a snail and a shell, a community and a technical standard. A lot of people, when they think about fire, they think about the technical standard, but from my point of view, the community is actually what makes a difference. So we built an open community. The goal of the open community is to make it easier to exchange healthcare information. Um, that is our, that's our goal. Um, it had it, it manifests in all sorts of ways and all sorts of different societies and all sorts of different technical environments. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot of political overtones that we just try and keep away from. Any way that you can improve the exchange of healthcare information is a beneficial way for somebody. But we do certainly have politics running through us. <clears throat> um, because the open community, that means open participation. We use web infrastructure as hard as we can, social media. And, and one of the interesting things about that is if you ask me how many people are in the community, I don't know because there's no way to identify who's in the community or who's not because people just roll in, roll out as much as they feel the need. Like, you know, 50, 60 people work full time, 100% of their time of their life on what we're doing. And then beyond that, hundreds, thousands, potentially thousands of people. We have a chat website where I'll hang out. The chat website has 15,000 registered individuals right now. It's pretty big. It's led by HL7, which Chris mentioned before, which means that we're deeply connected to the worldwide health community through governments and vendors and healthcare providers and industry consortiums and so forth, professional associations. And then what we, what we do, if someone proposes to the community in one of our many channels, we should make it possible to do X. And then we argue about whether X is worth doing. And then we decide we're gonna do it. So then we argue about what we're trying to achieve. And then we argue about how we're gonna do it. And we argue about what we wrote about how we're gonna do it. And then we argue about whether that works or not. Basically we argue about absolutely everything. And at the end, when we run out of energy because everyone's like, that's good enough, then we write that down and that becomes a technical standard. So it's just a record of our disagreements. <laughs> and, and what it is, is we use the web way of managing information to manage healthcare information. And so all we said is, here's the web, all of the things that are the web, the, the technology, the frameworks, the way of thinking about information, the way of building global systems and solutions and communities, we just can do all that and we're gonna apply it healthcare and manage information for healthcare. And one big piece of what we have is continuity with existing healthcare standards. Because we know that the existing healthcare information that everyone has in their records is a treasure of unbelievable, unestimable price. And we, we have to carry that forwards. And any, anybody could design a wonderfully good healthcare information framework without the constraint of carrying the existing system forward. Most of our challenges are in actually trying to balance between how we would like to do things now and how we've been doing things for hundreds of years. 
And, and that's a big part of what we do is continuity. And then what happens is we publish this standard as public treasure. And, and governments, vendors, individual consultants, um, billion dollar companies, trillion dollar companies in one case, they bring their best people to us and give them to us and their best technologies. What do they do that for? They do that because if everybody owns the technology, then they can assume that everybody has it and make a business out of it. Whereas if they have to sell the platform in order to get you interested, they just won't be a starter. Right? So we are all richer because everybody owns it. It's public treasure. And so our job is to curate and care for the public treasure and look after it properly. And then people trust us to do that. So our whole government stack around doing that. And then they say, we will give it to you or we'll give our best people to you or commit our future architecture to you on the basis that we believe that you'll keep that in trust and carry us forward into new businesses, new, new solutions, new national approaches, new standards, whatever it is that you're interested in. Okay. So we started in 2011, the community grew. We have a whole bunch of formal metrics around how the community grows and whole, it's a whole theory. Um, now, um, we've been gradually adopted all around the world, but I want to I draw your one attention. In 2016, Apple said, we're going to use that as the basis of our uh, health information management framework on the phone. It's an amazing thing for Apple to have done. There is nowhere else in the Apple ecosystem where they rely on technical standards that they don't control. But they decided that in health, they trusted us, and it was their least worst option. And uh, technically, that wasn't that remarkable what they're doing, but just as a business impact, it's just been massive. Um, and just as a, you know, endorsement of what we're about. And, and so we now have increasing focus in US, particularly USA, where a senior government secretary stood up at an industry conference middle of last year and said, there is no other standards anymore. The only standard we care about is fire. And I'm like, uh, okay, fine. We have to live with that. But um, progress here in Australia, well, I'm not so good. <clears throat> Some of you might have seen this. This is called the Gartner Technology Adoption Curve. The idea is that somebody invents some new technology and everyone is wildly excited about it and gets hopelessly carried away about the potential it has. And so people try to make use of it and suddenly it turns out that it didn't solve all the problems people thought and after all change is hard and people are hard and so everyone gets totally disillusioned in the technology because that's what everybody blames. But then eventually people actually start using it and into the slope of enlightenment and then finally the plateau of productivity. This by the way has nothing to do with technology. It's all to do with people. And it applies in science just as much as it applies to technology and politics too. Um, and so people often ask me where we are on this curve. And the answer is you can only tell retrospectively a few years later. <laughs> but, but at least it appears, I, I used to say that my primary job was to try and hold the peak down so that the trough didn't seem so deep. <laughs> it's now my primary focus is to help us through the trough. So I think, I think we're kind of maturing a little bit there. Okay, all right. So we had, we had three goals. We wanted to disrupt healthcare IT standards. We wanted to disrupt healthcare IT. And then we wanted to disrupt healthcare. And, and I want to be clear when I say this, I'm, I'm not interested. A lot of people hear disruption and think Uber or whatever and billion dollar state shop, share market changes. I don't care about any of that. But that may or may not happen. Companies may or may not provide value. They may or may not go poof. Government projects may or may not provide value. I'm interested in disruption, disrupting the healthcare process, right? Not, I don't care about business. And, and so you have to think that when you think about disruption. <laughs> so disrupting healthcare IT standards, we move to an open source, open process, very agile process with a lot more focus on implementation success 
We also successfully destroyed several standards developments organisations that were sitting on their um, comfortable rear end and said, no, you've got to be much hungrier than that. That's the consequence of giving stuff away. And this, this process is largely done. The healthcare standards organisations, most of them, that still remain understand that they're going to have to live on the smell of an oily rag and do a much better service than they used to. And none of it means anything to you guys. You're kind of three steps down the chain from that, but gradually that pays off over time because the standards organisations were more into themselves and controlling the process rather than delivering value. It happens to all organisations in the end. Okay, then we said we wanted, and that's done. And it's that the process is not complete, but it's in the bag, it's gonna happen. Then we said we wanted to disrupt healthcare IT. So what that means is we wanted to empower applications, companies or project teams that write applications, whether commercial or not, to offer more functionality at less cost. That's the bottom line, right? And we wanted to drive implementations towards interoperability as a core. And I'm going to explain that because that's really key. I'll skip that slide. This is the old model of how we used to develop applications, which are the ones that you will use enterprise information systems, EHRs, whatever. And I, for 15 years, I ran Kestrel Computing, which sold enterprise information systems like this. We've got our database, we've got all our code, we've got our big circle that we work within, we own everything in the circle, and it's closed. And then all our customers come to us in Vegas for specific access to specific pieces of information by some text interface or an actual server interface or some data extraction. And so we do, we add that on the perimeter of the system. It's not inherently part of what we do. It's too expensive. It's not maintainable. When, when I was at Kestrel, one stage I did an audit and we had 1500 requests for these kind of additions to our perimeter. And I convinced the board that we should actually prioritize them. So we spent six months prioritizing those. And at the end, we had 3,000 on the waiting list. Because everyone said, hey, they're working, they're working on that. We better get everything on the list. And you can imagine how long the list is for an international provider like Cerner or Epic. It's epically long. <laughs> and, and the business, the economy means, the economics of the business means you will never, ever do enough of these. But, but that model itself is the problem. We're trying to move everyone to the model on the far side, which is where you put your database in place, you put your core business logic in place, you make it all available through a common API that all your programs have to be using and that is based on standards. And then your product is interoperable at its core. And no longer do your business partners have to come begging to you to open something up Everything is open all the time. And so they can do whatever kind of integration they want. They can go to third parties, whatever, because it's a standards-based interface. And so that's integration deeply into products. And, and so we are pushing the industry to that. Surely you can't take a system like this and just magically turn it into the other system. Um, it will be a case of gradually new companies come offering systems based on the model on the right and bring them to market. But in order to have the model on the right, you have to have the relevant standards. That is what we're chasing, building those relevant standards so that you actually get IT systems that are actually open and you can integrate how you want rather than begging and begging and begging. And, and really, that the model on the right is more expensive to develop. That's why it doesn't happen now. But we can drive that down by using technology and community and skills and libraries that are widely available, um, being an open and active community, getting more reuse out of what we do. And all this does is drive down the cost um, of the work and makes it feasible to develop better software. So we set out to empower applications to offer more functionality and we do that. We want to drive implementations towards interoperability as a core that is happening. It is far from happened, but it's starting to happen. 
Um, and the other thing we do, how am I going for time? Plenty, Plenty of time, okay. So I don't know, how many, how many of you are involved in open source software? Yeah, not many in this audience, but for those of you, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a special. I, open source software is the worst software on the market. Did you know that? When I first heard that, I'm like, that's just rubbish. And I heard it from some big American consultant guy, but his question was, well, if it's not the worst, someone's selling something that's not as good as what you can get for free. How's that going to play out? Well, you can't sell something that you can, when you can get something better for free. So open source is the floor of the market. Anything that exists ex only exists due to vendor lock-in and it's going to disappear eventually. So that means then that if you contribute to open source software, you're lifting the floor of the market. You're forcing companies to do one of two things, get better or disappear. That's what we do. As well as making a standard, we also ship open source software that's better than what they're shipping. It's a challenge to them, get better or die. And, and we're doing that as hard as we can. And that's, so that's part of what we do is use open source to drive change into the market. If something that's free is more interoperable than something you paid a billion dollars for, well, you see how that plays out. So, so, that's, so this is in process. We are changing and in five to 10 years, you, if you are clinical providers or uh, clinical administrators, you will have much better choices. That's our goal, but it's not yet done. Then we said, we wanted to disrupt healthcare. This is not done at all. It's just starting. And, and a part of, part of, see, when I, when I said, at one stage, I actually said, I'm done with this community. It's too, it's too slow and it's too rigid and it's not listening to what we really need to do. And I said, I'm just going to walk away from standards. But while I was thinking about that, Someone in my family got sick and paid a significant price for not a, the information not being in the right place at the right time. And, and I was sitting there doing a root cause analysis and I kept coming back to that standards really matter. They're not visible. You take them for granted and they sit down at the bottom of the stack and you should take them for granted. You didn't need to know about them. But then as consumers, you get frustrated by what you get because you don't have what you should have. And, and I knew that I could contribute at standards. So my contention is that if we get the standards in place, then the products can be better. And if the products are better, then we can support seamless information flows, which then lets us go back and say, well, what do we want to have as clinical systems? So, so our primary goals with healthcare is to remove IT as a barrier to seamless care. Care that crosses governance boundaries, that's where all the problems happen. Governance boundaries are communication boundaries. Why? Also, we want to allow AI to be deployed at scale. Now, AI, incredible tool. The cool thing about AI is it fails in incredible ways. Um, so, so here's a couple of good ones from the last conferences, the last six months. If you ever, so there's a guy who spent, this is the kind of thing IT people do, he, he spent time teaching an AI to turn ze horses into zebras in photos. And then he applied it to a rather famous photo. And if you want to see how that turned out, use Google Putin, as in the Russian president, Putin and zebra. <laughs> I didn't put a photo in, but, but do, do look that up because it demonstrates that AI can fail in unexpected ways. And, and then the other thing was I was at a radiology conference and there was a guy there talking about AI and how he taught an AI pro program to read chest x-rays better than radiologists. But then he said, but don't get too confident because I also taught my pigeons to outperform radiologists. <laughs> and you can look that paper up. That's a real serious published paper. Um, our contention is that AI will never be a good specific tool. It will always be a very sensitive tool. It's good at picking up possible patterns, but it will never be reliable without human intervention. And so therefore it follows that if you want to leverage AI, 
to um, make up for the weaknesses of humans as information processing units, which is a well-known problem, you need good integration into the information flow. That's what we're about. So we want AI to be deployed at scale, and, and that means really deep integration into the user's experience. If you have to separate it or it happens in the background, disaster. It needs to be really well integrated. And then we want to enable clinical champions to be able to take those two things and say, we can do projects that demonstrate improved clinical outcomes from changing processes. <coughs> so, so to rehash those points, clinical governance boundaries are points of failure and they're very often tied to physical buildings or organizational control. It really doesn't make any sense in this day and age that physical building boundaries represent information failure points, but they do. And I don't think that we want to rebuild our physical buildings. I think we just want to break those boundaries and say we don't need to have information flow boundaries at um, those governance boundaries. Instead, we want integration to information to flow across those boundaries and to be able to integrate. Wouldn't it be really good if you could have a care plan that said, we'll do these things at these times, now on my computer to actually organize all those things at these times, and for that to happen across different enterprises to book a physio, to book an x-ray, to book a, uh, a social support, to do that all seamlessly. How, at the moment you're gonna have like, how many phone calls are you gonna be making? And then you're gonna be shuffling. None of that makes any sense these days, right? That's a clinical governance failure. It's not a technology failure, but you can't fix that right now. So, so our contention is that if we get the information systems in place right, we get the information flows, then we can start addressing the clinical culture change. We didn't solve any problems. We just got out of the way of solving those, and, and so it's gonna need clinical champions. So looking around the world, we're seeing people building these things in practice. We're seeing institutions building single patient record, where multiple institutions, different kinds of institutions, linked by um, region, usually by region, are working on how to have a common patient record across institutions. So you don't talk anymore about the Monash medical record and the GP medical record, there's the patient's medical record. And, and there's all sorts of liability and policy and cultural issues, but there are institutions in several countries around the world solving those problems. <clears throat> there are institutions building cross enterprise integrated workflows where all the service, all the systems coordinate to a single scheduling engine so you can feed those care plans into the scheduling engine and actually have a coherent schedule. Not like my father who got prostate cancer and bounced around the system. Every little bounce was a new round of appointments and delays while he fulfilled the appointment in order to figure out his somewhat atypical prostate cancer treatment plan. It wasn't fun to watch that. <coughs> um, uh, so schedule, scheduling APIs, integrated care plans, and something else we're working on, which is plan definitions. So now we have an interoperable form of saying, this is a plan for a set of patients. And we can turn this into a plan for a patient. And then we can know what we need to do for that patient. And we can go ahead and organize all that stuff. And there are institutions building those out not here in Australia, to my knowledge. Um, and then to make all of the data across all the institutions available for AI, and then we can feed that back into the workflows that we're building. So now we're working with the clinical communities around the world to define evidence-based medicine resources so that we can actually start exchanging at a computing, computable level statements about the evidence base on which our plan definitions are based. We're working with them to describe population cohorts. So you can measure your outcomes against other institutions and find out how similar your population cohort is to find out whether your actual outcomes are com comparable or not. And it seems likely that in a few years time, 
US institutions will be required to publish their cohort definitions in public. So for instance, um, and, and to do that by um, provider, so that a senior surgeon probably has worse outcomes than a junior surgeon because he sees more difficult patients and you'll be able to quantify that. Um, we're also working around community-based idea development. So the idea is the community actually, and so these are systems running some places around the world now. It's particularly relevant to patients with mental health. If you get diagnosed with some you know, significant mental health issue, the, you get referred to a psych who creates you a care plan. And that care plan is then made available to your um, specialists, to your GP, to the emergency department, to the police, and to the courts. Anyway, if the police pick you up in the middle of the night having a major meltdown, they don't slam you in the jail. They go and look at your care plan and take you to your designated place of refuge or whatever. And if, and I assure you from knowing people with medical, uh, with mental health conditions, this, this is how it works. If you go to a GP or a specialist or an emergency physician, the first thing they say is your medication's wrong. Right? That's always the first thing they say. And that is really destructive to people with mental health. And instead of saying, we're gonna, you need to change your medication to disagree with the last person you saw, they actually go and make a change proposal on the care plan. And they debate it between the experts, because how's a mental health patient supposed to know? Right? And then they agree about what's the right thing for the patient. So I can't tell you, we, you know, I can't tell you how much of mental health patients I know would be blessed by a system like that. Um, and, and the whole goal in the long term, and this is very long term, is to automate the learning healthcare system. Um, but we're already seeing companies trying to bring this forward as a technology solution. And to me, that's missing the point. I mean, this is, none of this is a technology problem. All of this is an information management problem. <clears throat> so key to us then, and to me, is to empower the patients, to bring the patient and particularly the primary carer into the information framework. It fascinates me that the single most important person for most chronically ill patients, their primary carer, doesn't feature in the system. How do we, how do we produce that? Um, but, but the focus around the world um, in a number of countries is get the data to the patient to empower the patient. Now, my assessment of patients is getting data to a patient they own me. So, so I've got some data. There's a small fraction of patients with an unclear diagnosis who worship their data till they get their diagnosis. So like, yeah, okay, got my diagnosis. It's services that empower the patient, but you can't build the services without the data. So the data is a precondition for what matters, but it, it's not a solution. But, but the common frustrations of patients, any of you in the room who are patients know these frustrations. Scheduling and communication problems, conflicts around care plans, payments, even definitions of what the care plans are trying to do. Um, and the patient mostly resolves this, is the least informed of anybody in the system and the most stressed. So it's kind of really dumb. We, in fire, we have all these things. We could build integrated home care medication management. Years ago, I went to the Microsoft uh, Concept Home, and they showed uh, in the tour around the, the home, the, the mm. person doing the tour, they pulled out a drawer, they pulled out their medications, they spread their medications across the bench, and the system said, take one of those. And I remember looking at that going, <coughs> Wow, this is like 15 years ago. We had no hope of linking the physical bottle of medication with an instruction to take the medication. There was no way to link, to make those links. Now, all the pieces are in place to make those links. The medication databases, the EAN database, the um, standards to support the linkage, the pieces are all there, but nobody, except one country right now, is actually trying to bring that together to make it happen. And the one country, of course, they're doing it by themselves as a single country project, and then they'll look to roll it out um, on Apple or something. And having worked with Apple a bit over the last couple of years, the way they work is to, to make something scale to a population, 
clearly the government needed to understand that with the Maya chart. There's a difference between a good idea and an idea that scales to a population. That's a huge amount of work. And, and the other thing that we're going to see coming is cloud healthcare providers. This is not science fiction. It's happening in the States now. It's happening in Australia now. All the pieces to make it happen are there. It's just a matter of funding the business. But the basic idea is really simple. S in enroll a patient, suck up all their clinical information. It's now, per courtesy of government, available in the States. Um, do them a really thorough physical. Now you, are, now you know them. The first, instead of turning to 911 or to their GP or whatever, they turn to your app. Your app is first. Your app knows where they are. You don't need to tell you where they are. You would know where they are. You know them already. You don't need to ask them who they are. In a real emergency, we're, we're, we're three steps ahead straight away. They turn to you and you throw, this is the first and most obvious use of AI in the healthcare system. You use the AI to consider the patient's symptoms and decide whether treating them will be profitable or not. If it's profitable, then you come to them and give them like concierge service. If it's not, you dump them on the old bricks and mortar system that's sitting there taking the worst because they don't know how to do anything different. That's how AI will first impact the system this year. Not in Australia this year. In Australia, um, the bureaucrats in Canberra told me, I know that'll happen here in Australia. We've got the system sewn up. So when you think about the ramifications of that statement, we will stop patients getting better care because we can. We will, but it has a downside, all of what I've just talked about, which is it's going to be pretty disruptive, particularly to the bricks and mortar system that we all live in today, which will be flat-footed Mickey taking all the worst cases. I've told the governments, the government in Australia, that the single most uh, the biggest threat to the current healthcare system is AI-mediated disruption of the billing schedule, and the only solution is AI-mediated um, adaption of the billing schedule. I don't think they're working on that, from what I can see. <laughs> but that's like that's tomorrow's reality, and and it's true that in Australia we can by and large keep that away from patients, and and you're certainly going to hear a whole lot of it's not safe. It's not safe. Just like here in Australia, it's not safe to let the patient see their pathology results before the GP mediates that. Did you know that in most of the world, pathology results go directly to the patient? It's just a legal, it's just how it is. Whereas in Australia, the patients don't get to see the pathology results until the GP gets around to looking at them because that's safer. It's not, it's not about safety. You're going to hear the safety card played a lot in the next few years as digital disruption comes to the healthcare system. So part of my goal here in telling you this is too many people look at digital disruption and say, I want to know how digital disruption makes me do my job better. Forget that. You need to ask what will be left to me after digital disruptions happen to me and how do I get ahead of that curve, right? Don't think of it as a technology problem. It's not a technology problem. It's an information management problem. And if you sit this out and assume that other people will figure it out, you've already seen how good the IT companies are at figuring out the ramifications of the information management solutions they put in place. They don't have a clue because they're technologists, not consumers of the information. So my appeal is don't sit this out, get involved. So join us. Now, when I say us, I'm clear. Fire, the prior project, the team that work around me, hundreds of people, we are a critical infrastructure enabler for information handling and, and a community that builds that. So you're welcome to join us. But we are richly endowed with people. It's actually all of the consequential pieces of work that need to be done to take the infrastructure and turn it into solutions that people can use to build public knowledge about what they look like. That's where we really need new community in all sorts of ways. And the governance of all those communities is critical <clears throat> um, to build confidence and trust. You need to be truly committed to open community treasure. What I appeal to people everywhere, civil society, 
it's not looking particularly healthy these days. I appeal to all of you to spend a few hours every week contributing to some open community treasure because that's what builds in the end builds civil society. Um, so join us or other communities and thank you for listening. Um, Now, do you want to take questions or just go to the panel? Uh, you take some questions, there's plenty of time. Okay. Um, just while you're pondering your questions, we will have a more panel discussion in a minute. Angela, I might be able to uh, yeah, set that up for us. Um, I'm sure you appreciated listening to Graham. There's not many people who can, who are working right down at this very deep technical layer who can overlay a vision for the health system on top of it. It's not a common skill. So. I've heard Graham talk quite a lot, and that is very consistent with what he says all around uh, the world from what I've seen. Any questions direct for Graham at this stage? Graham, just a question. How often do you bar against the preconceptions or misconceptions around confidentiality? I think we walk that line every day. Um, so I have a few things to say about that. Um, first of all, it's far from obvious to me who owns which bits of the record. So clearly a patient has a right to access their own record of the treatment they received. But a hospital record or a GP's record includes records about why they provided the, the support they provided, which very frequently gets into teamwork that crosses multiple other patients. Words of entry. But even if you somehow magically solve that, which in the US they magically solved it by fiat, if it mentions you, you have a right to it. Um, your record, when you get your record, is full of information about other people. So I don't know how many of you have heard of Facebook's um, people you might know system. Any, anyone heard about this? So Facebook built this, they collected information about you from other people. So you can't opt out of it because they didn't collect any of it from you. So they have nearly everyone in the world in the system. No one can opt out of it. Now, think about healthcare. Say patients start getting their records. Um, and then Amazon. We'll pick Amazon. Although it's un totally unfair to pick Amazon in terms of our attitude, but they have the capability. Starts offering people 500 bucks a medical record. That's street value for a medical record in the States. Um, so Amazon starts offering everyone 500 bucks and buys up, I don't know, 100 million um, uh, IT records. What are they gonna do with that? They've just got surveillance on every single care provider in the country. They can now tell you who's the most effective or not. And it's not information the care providers can opt out of because it didn't come from them. You can see where that's going, right? So I'm really worried about that. And, and I would, I regard that as one of the key political outcomes from our work is nobody is an island. And all of the political, um, all of the political discussion about consent assumes that you are an island in your own record. And it's just not true. So we've got a huge amount of pain coming around that. Um, um, on the other hand, the other thing that we have is we have a subsystem in fire where you can say, this is how I want to share my information. This is the criteria for sharing it. But nobody uses it because it's all too hard because in order to, if you talk to humans about what they want to decide to share, they'll say things like, I'm sh I'll share all my records for clinical research except for my mental health records or my sexual disease records. But records aren't tagged that way, right? You can't look through, computably look through a record and say, ping, 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 and sort them out. It's, it's done by hand by on a per piece of paper basis by HIMS um, managers, and it just you can't compute that, and and so that doesn't work. So in practice, consent um, and confidentiality, which are tied together in practice at the moment, are done as a gatekeeper thing. You're either in or you're out, completely in or completely out. And then we have this wonderful thing where we call it consent, where you rock up at the hospital and they say. We will treat you if you consent to our information sharing policy, and they call that consent. <laughs> yeah, like, that's real good. So, um, on the other hand, I can't I can't hold back the group of people working on the consent resource to actually say you need to produce something practical that people can make work. 
because nobody can make anything work in this space. We just wing it and, and actually from looking around the world, for instance, did you know, if you go to a VA institution in the States and there's hundreds of them, um, your discharge summary will be sent to every other VA institution, whether you consented to that or not. And they even ask because they don't know how not to. Like they don't, it's too hard. And there's a massive amount of technical debt in the existing information systems supporting healthcare around this. Because we share, we don't share what we should share, we share what we don't share. We do that now out of control and then we pretend that it's not a problem it's technical debt because we can't fix it so i don't know any particular solution to that except that we have a significant amount of technical debt there there's there's one stream of thought um which was put at a conference last year i was at by the cmio for queensland health which is that people die today because we didn't share information about them and that's true and so we should just not give people the choice we should just share everybody's information everywhere because that will be our better net outcome than not sharing it. How many people in the room think that's a reasonable <laughs> position to take? Nobody. Usually there's a few hands. Of course, it's easy for rich white males to say that. But um, I, think, I think we have a lot of water to go under the bridge on this subject. Um, at the moment, and that's, that's one of the things I said about politics is we'll keep out of the, we want to make it easier to share information and easier to share it with um, grant, fine granularity, but we, there's a huge amount of work to be done yet. Lots of space for PhD projects there. Okay, that's, that's it. <laughs> So I'm just going to introduce this evening's other panellists and ask them to uh, make their way to the front of the room as, as I'm speaking. Um, so uh, firstly we have Dr Andrew Patterson, welcome Andrew. I haven't actually met Andrew properly. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrew has an undergraduate degree in computer science and a PhD in software engineering, uh, extensive experience in health IT, including with Penn Computer Systems, NITA and Medical Director and those of you who know a bit about health IT will recognise all of those entities and acronyms. Uh, Andrew's here because he's currently a health software architect with GenoVic, which I believe is a, a, a consortium thing between Melbourne Genomics Alliance and CSIRO. Yep. yep. And Andrew in particular has done some work with FHIR and that's why he's here. And there is some interesting work about the use of FHIR as a language for describing healthcare things that is going into the genomic space already. So um, please welcome Andrew. And uh, we also have Dr. Aldita Aletti, who's a, a colleague of mine. Aldita is uh, very IT literate, obviously. She has an undergraduate degree in computer engineering and a PhD in software engineering and AI. Uh, she has extensive experience in IT as an academic. So she's one of my colleagues from the Faculty of IT uh, at Clayton campus. Um, including experience at the University of Karlsruhe and the University of Kaiserslautern. Did almost get through it all. So her official titles are currently Senior Lecturer uh, in the Faculty of IT and Course Director for the Bachelor of Software Engineering in the Faculty of IT. Please welcome Aldita as well. Um, just a little bit of scene setting too. Graham's mentioned the word uh, community quite a lot. So I guess our interest in the faculty has been in trying to establish community trying to establish ecosystem around fire. Um, we and our Malaysia colleagues have actually been uh, using it as an educational vehicle for some software design subjects last year and again this year. Um, we're increasingly trying to work with other people interested in growing that ecosystem. Uh, tonight is part of that as well. And because uh, we also believe in the need for this community to grow, skills to be applied, people to be interested and systems to be connected for patient benefit. Um, so um, I'm going to open it up for questions. We've got plenty of time for questions. So um, I'd like to hear some from the floor to any of the panelists. Jim, I can see one coming. Go ahead, Jim. I'm trying to get the words right. <laughs> what, what are the common characteristics of successful ecosystems in healthcare, academia, and industry that drive 
uh, innovations to improve our outcomes, either through APIs. In other words, are there any standard features that seem across the world that are associated with success between the different players, healthcare professionals, IT, and other organisations? <laughs> you seem more well, it's not the best system. There's, there's a variety of different kinds of ecosystems, but I did a survey before I set on fire and said, what's more likely? So all these things are startups, they're the same kind of success rates as startups. And I'm like, what well, I'm going to do when I do this, what's my most you know, likely chance to succeed? Uh, so first of all, you have to be hyper responsive to the community, the, the people who are going to try and make use of it. If you at every stage turn around and say, well, we don't care about you, and you just blow your community apart. Um, but at the same time, you also need some backing from some formal standards governance process so that it doesn't become someone's individual fiefdom and that people, particularly large enterprises, big companies, governments, are comfortable that they can commit and trust a process that there is conflict resolution. Open source projects are too prone to falling apart or disappearing, while projects with really strong governance are too prone to becoming non-responsive. So walking that really that knife edge, I think that's a critical thing. Being relevant and up to date with technology is, a, is necessary, but not sufficient. But to me, all of this is all about people and and having the right people. And so the other thing is <coughs> you, need, you, need, you need the edge that the working consultants, contractors bring. You need, the, you need the depth that academics bring. You need the hunger that companies bring. And you need the concern for risk the governments bring. You have to have, you have, to have those things in, in measure as well. Well, Dita, from a, from a, you mean you've worked, seen IT overseas and you've worked from the discipline of software engineering. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, that was a perfect answer. I can't add much to that, but I've seen, I've seen the EMR systems used. I, 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 my knowledge is not, you know, as, as big as Francis knows, but, and I've seen also being a software engineer and working with these software systems, I was really surprised that they still look use this monolithic kind of view of systems where you build these big systems that have all possible functionalities that may be needed in different kinds of departments. So they you configure that system to cater to specific doctors. So then the system becomes so cumbersome with all these fields that usually are left empty because there's no time to fill all these fields. And then you have to click, 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 back, 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 click, click, so you have to refine the field that you want. The data that you're getting it's mostly empty field because you know you can't really the doctors don't have the time. So I, I I found it really surprising. I guess the only example that I can think of such a bad system is the one we use at Monash, where and I guess it's, it's because these organizations are so complex uh, and, and and not much enough time is spent to think for this kind of system. So I think Graham is really humble to say that fire is just <laughs> A new technology and not there yet. I think it's an amazing technology. I fell in love first moment I saw it because it actually really is about the latest software engineering technology out there. Um, and another thing that I think of by is that it will democratize healthcare because I know different you know hospitals they have different kind of funding models and then you cannot afford this different CERN or rapid kind of functionality. But what I will do will make it so easy to build those apps and put in this database and to cater to specific interfaces for specific doctors. Uh, so what kind of ecosystem? I guess we are very interested to work with you and so we this kind of office at Monash and we're in love with fire, it's an amazing technology. And we're specifically interested in that AI for, uh, for fire, um, which I think there's some great potential there to unlock this amazing uh, data that is now recorded for patients and there's some interesting findings. So the project we're working on is on uh, predicting hospital Required complications, so we can really use AI to, to help our practitioners um, with this augmented intelligence. So I didn't quite answer your question because I thought that was a perfect answer, but just you know, um, yeah.
the form to learn inside how fantastic the work of Graham is. I really appreciate that. Thanks. Andrew, do you have any particular? Uh, I, I probably work at a lower level on less system wide things and, and more specific projects. So, you know, smaller, small companies doing medical software projects. I cannot think, it, you know, I'm probably batting like three quarters of them have failed. Three quarters of them have gone to pilot and ended up nowhere or have been disbanded at some point. So, possibly I'm the wrong person to ask what the, uh, <laughs> success, the success factor is. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm the, uh, the, 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 the reason for fails. But uh, I mean, I think all of the things that Graves said resonate with me, which was a um, combination of the right people, good people, um, support from all of the players in the thing. Um, you know, I've had projects that have been canned because the company got bought out by someone and lost, you know, the principal person sponsoring it. So there's that kind of petty thing that makes things fall apart. Um, but just also, you know, just general governance of projects, all of those can lead to failure. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, the right people, everyone kind of work in the same direction. All right, appreciate it. Any other questions? Paul. Uh, Paul Butler from Long Paul. So I guess, um, you know, thank you. So this was working for, for us. Um, you know, there was a moment where we did a project where we got our company consultants to come and have a look at all the health systems that our health was using. And then I had this picture which had about, you know, 500 more all over it. And, you know, and, and so as an enterprise, we said, this is madness, we can't support this. And so we went, continued down the path of, you know, certain health. We want 500 balls, we want a handful of very large balls backed by a big reliable entity who we can win up in the middle of the night and they're not reliant on a bloody service being full of main water block. So, so, you know, I'm interested in your perspective on because I sort of hear you saying, you know, that's you know, not such a great task. I would say, Paul, it has been the pathway to recently. There hasn't been other pathways, but I think part of this is the, the world's changing and there's pieces in place to maybe tweak that pathway or take a completely different pathway. But I'll let... So, if you have 500 balls in the air, then the question is who's going to juggle them and why? If you go and buy a single system from a big vendor, you just throw the balls over the vendor to juggle. You know, I was the vendor. We're, we're, we're maybe better at juggling the balls the way we want to juggle them. Is that the way you want to juggle them at the time you want to? You know, and you can, there's a single point of contact which you can throw all the problems. And I mean, it's really true. It's really it is a single point of contact, and I've just never seen anyone get to that point. And and I think if I think if the problem is moving deck chairs around the boat house, right? You have five hundred volts. That's that's and and so like I was consulting last year to the VA, who are about to ditch their own internal system for CERN for like more money than you can you can write zeros. And it's, it'll be a golf stacking a large amount of money when they're finished. Well, they, that because they couldn't figure out how to manage their own problems. Will CERN manage their own problems for them better? Like, it's far from obvious to me that any of this is anything but moving the deck chairs around. And, and we, our, our attitude is all those balls are a problem. Can you actually have less balls or do you just pretend that you have less? And, and if, but if you have systems that are in deeply interoperable, which is not currently any of your options, that lowers the overall cost for any of the possible options. I don't know if that answers you. Maybe I can. I kind of see, uh, I guess I went to a talk at um, Royal Children's of Boston, and Royal Children's have had their pick for four or five years and they had the clinicians were there and they were presenting, a, basically they were having a, a one hour session where they were um, presenting, but they've all uh, been told you have to use their big 
uh, storing everything. You know, we want one, uh, one big wall. And they're all presenting their incredibly unique requirements that they had for things. And they were presenting their experiments and they were the most obscure. Some, you know, what does one and they're doing something to do with orthopedics and measuring the angle of a person's arm after a surgery or something they needed to record angles. And I've never seen angle of arm in any healthcare model ever. But, it, you know, it's a totally, you know, legitimate thing that they need to, to measure. And so I come to Graham's point, is, is it 500 balls because there are 500 genuine needs? And if there are 500 genuine needs to record data in particular types, I think perhaps the world the fire can take you to is a large ball centrally managed that has you know, proper backup, that is well maintained, etc., cetera, and a, uh, an, an ecosystem of apps storing the edge, the smaller balls around the edge. And that's probably a better world than the 500 balls all being 500 access database and Excel charts living on the clinician's desktop. Yeah, I'm not a favor of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, I, you know, I don't know how we get to that true, that, you know, a real ecosystem for the moment, you know, even at the Epic or Sona uh, Fire stuff, it's not like they're going to let you store annual of person's arm or put your research studies into the epic system, etc. But in my head, that's the kind of world that I think hospitals should like to go to if they could. I mean, coming back to something I said at the start, Paul and Graham can disagree, he knows much more about it than me, but, you know, it seems like genuinely, put aside the reasons they've done it, but Epic and Cerner in particular have invested time and effort and energy in, uh, in having fire work with their entire environments at no small cost. There's reasons why they do it, but it's not like they're saying it's our way or the highway. They're actually seeming to respond to this opportunity by saying there's a better world for us in this too. So there's no sense of either or here. It is, you know, well, it, in our current reality, <laughs> this is our desired future state. I mean, it's true in some perspectives. Uh, Epic and Cerner have no interest in sharing deeper knowledge about the system, only patient summary information. And, and there's very obvious business reasons why they take that approach. Sean Exengrup just from Eastern Health. I'm a clinician and Chris and I have interacted a little bit about these sorts of things. Um, from your talk, it seemed like a lot of this that's happening right now, the cutting edge, is not here in Australia. From a clinician perspective, one of the particular issues we have in Australia is sort of probably an even bigger fragmentation of healthcare than in other places. Like each individual practitioner is a separate system, so to speak. But take, even taking that aside, I mean, I work in a big hospital at Eastern Health. We've had EMR implemented, what is it, about two years ago now. But it's basically an electronic um, piece of paper. And so you went, you know, you talked about specific data points, etc. In each of our specialties, we have data points, but it's all put in in free text, non-searchable, um, non-integrable. We put it in once for patient care, we put it in another time for a audit meeting, we put it a third time for a for a multidisciplinary meeting. Uh, it's gross duplication and 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 sometimes you know kind of the same piece of information put in three different ways and five different places. Um, and, and we, we keep debating around meeting tables, et cetera, about how we can fix that. And it's usually held back by a lack of resources. They've, they've implemented the MR, but with limitations because of the limitation of resources. It's good to hear that these things exist, but I don't have a great deal of faith they'll be implementable in the near future into that, which means, you know, the traditional system is, is hamstrung and likely to get more hamstrung as these things exist as a reality. So how do we solve that? As a clinician, I feel very frustrated in that process. And that's probably a fractional frustration patients must feel when the system doesn't serve them. So I'll start with an observation. A couple of years ago, I visited a hospital in the USA with 1,300 beds and 1,500 programmers working for them. <laughs> How many do you have put in a standard Australian hospital, 800 to 1,000 beds? Before or after they buy <laughs> <laughs> At best, or worst. And, um, 
you know, here in Australia, so some hospitals, some institutions have said, we commit to a digital future. We believe that we can rebuild our healthcare if we leverage that to the max, and that requires substantial investment. Um, it seems to me that in Australia, mostly we believe that we have to digitize our paper approach and then do as little as possible and spend as little as possible while we do that. And then we get as little as possible with this map. So it makes sense, right? Um, overseas, you see people taking a far different approach. But we get political for a moment. The approach we have here in Australia is driven by what happened in Canberra and uh, Spring Street and others where the governments have very little vision and idea how to build infrastructure that actually is fit for the future. They're just busy with strings and smoke and trying to cobble things together and anything that they build is about building control and that attitude permeates our society. I didn't realise it when I was just living here. I thought we were in a pretty good state. But the more I travel, the more I realise how shallow that is. We, 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 to, to follow the point, we, we have one of the more expensive healthcare systems and it fails in significance next to the US, but we do. And yet, today we were discussing equipment that doesn't work in theatre and the fact that the, there's an agreement that it needs to be replaced, but there isn't funding to replace it. So when we're struggling to get the basic equipment, uh, I mean, this is talking about a paradigm shift and and really sort of you know changing the system, which is it's how, how, how do we how do we bridge that gap? I guess is my question. It, what I've been begging the government to do in Canberra, and I'm gradually getting further and further up the stack in Canberra in my engagements as I get more and more well-known outside Australia. Um, what I've been begging them to do is actually to get out of the way, to stop trying to build solutions and start building infrastructure and architecture and, and that looks into the future and gives people the ability to say, we're gonna try something here and see what works. Because right now, I tell you a story about the first PAC system that came into Australia. Let's be careful how it goes. I worked at a vendor. So, um, your college of radiology. Any, any radiologists in the room? We have one. Um, college of radiology. Oh. <laughs> um, this is kind of quite a long time ago, but, but uh, one of the big wigs in the college of radiology declared that he was going to get the first PAC system. He micromanaged the implementation process into the ground and then said the vendor was the problem. <laughs> And so then no one would do PACs in Australia because it wasn't ready for Australia. You, you need a good success story or too small to not have a success first up. Um, so, you know, what I, that's what I would like. And if we apply pressure, we need the government to provide infrastructure and leadership. We don't need them to provide solutions. They're busy doing the wrong thing at the moment. If I often rail about the fact that we're so dependent on the government, but here I am doing it. Um, you, we don't have enough money to maintain the system we've got and we don't have enough money to commit to a better system that works differently. And, and so actually that's part of the, we're paying the price for 20 years of coasting. It's getting worse, not better. It's a dead end that we're on. Um, and, and I don't know the way out of it, but I know that if we can't experiment, then we won't ever know the way out. I wish I could say more, but but at 20, you know, the, the entire time I've been doing digital health, we've been going around telling the world how great we are in healthcare and how great we're going to show everyone how to do things, and we've done nothing. It's worth it, and I'm sorry for the my HR person to look on top later, <laughs> but I, I have three harsh comments for that. And I can, because I was a senior designer for it, but I did take the I'll, I'll take one from Helene in one second. I'll just, yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> just going to say to Sharon, I mean, I hear that sense of how do we get out of this. Two things. The F in fire is about fast. So it's about more easily building interoperability, building tools that use interoperability. And the same company that provides your EMR has done this already. 
So, you know, are they going to respond to the customers in this country? How hard are the customers going to ask? How hard are the customers going to work on the intermediary of government? That's I think that, that's a right big step. It's the, yes. it's the yeah. so hospital infrastructure. It, it's a system. And, and yeah. you know, then they, with the best of intentions, they're sticking with the existing hmm. system, which sometimes makes some of those things yes. very difficult. But, but a lot of this can add on to and augment the existing system. There's nothing in this about having to replace all that one. No, we're talking revolution at times. CMIO of large, huge hospitals in the US, and, and when they get together and say, you know, we believe this is a part forward to something, they get listened to. Well, I don't feel we get that in Australia. Well, we're a little bit less forward about nominating individuals. <laughs> right there, I know. But Hyde's a, has some runs on the board. On the other hand, it's kind of odd to think the government will put one name up. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not talking. I'm, I'm more the, the, the health IT community in the US well, feels a, feels that there is a group of people. They would say these are thought leaders in this space, and they all get together sure. and say this is a direction. The government almost listens to them. Doesn't come to them. The government doesn't have to come to the thought leaders. But that's an effort strategy. The most effective strategy to drive change, better than any other strategy is the thought leaders who are well respected and credible and can get them all having a consensus and they're nominated by specific voters. That is the most effective driver of change in every place. And it does work in Australia. We just have to get the right people. Any other questions for the panel? Yeah. 
systems are not really systems, they're development frameworks for working systems. Um, a lot of it relates to how much resources you're willing to throw and how much management power you're willing to throw at making them work for you. I mean, you can, you can spend, you know, my US hospitals do two or three hundred million dollars doing that. It's not money that went to the vendor, it's money you spend figuring out your own processes and, and trying to get them right. Or you can do strings and mirrors stuck with access or red cap or whatever. We've all seen them all over, over the place. And then, then you get back to your shattered data, data environment. But, you know, I, we will say this is not a technology problem. This is a people problem. If you have a shattered data environment, it's because you have a shattered management environment. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have solved that problem. Other than the um, again, you're moving decades along the park end. Okay. Uh, my question is a little technical. Uh, to touch your idea of AI, which apparently is a more weak idea of using AI out of the system, which is, uh, which I'm on the same uh, boat, but if there were like some the testers here from NGI, general idea of like patient buildings, they would definitely say that. AI could be replaced, but I'm not going to defend them. Um, my question is, when we are calling consumers or the users of this product, when they are like the Microsoft example you put on the table, they are on their own self to see to decide which drop, which medicine to use, and the far as part of it, how do you say we can use these cognitive agents currently playing around in the AI? Could integrate fire into the ecosystem of healthcare to make it more attractive. I got you AI is more attractive when when human beings is also playing a role, not AI itself. So my if I put it in a very simple way, the AI you're talking, how could it be integrated into the ecosystem using the fire? So there's two, there's two parts to the integration for us. One is to enable AI systems to get the data they need to drive them. So they, they know what they want to know about the patient. And, and actually there's this a whole subsystem around getting information, getting the right information, how much of their assumptions about their patients are followable from when they're controls, how much they're. And then there's the actual like, uh, is it scanning for, you know, likelihood of a of a, or a diagnosis, or is it looking for patients to um, recruit into some study, or is it um, looking to make ma uh, recommendations for more efficient care? All those different things. You can use AI in the background to produce a bunch of reports. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple in a, in a second where that sort of project blows out. Um, and then you can use AI, you know, like say you're going to suggest that this patient should be considered for, let's say, uh, um, well, you should do an HPA and C again. Yeah. It's too long, you forgot to do it. That, there could be a reason why you didn't do it, because it discussion with the patient, you didn't do it. You can't have that happen off in the background and someone's going to left a, a problem. You want that to actually pop up in the information system at the time. So we've got a whole bunch of work around how to make, how to enable an AI system to jump into the workflow and say, hey, did you think about this? Or you should do this? Or do you want me to do this for you? And so we've got an API around that. So, so it's, 
there's typically a, a combination of that. So, so here's a, a typical case where that those things interact, and this is production. Um, uh, Beth Israel Dinkas decided that they would wanted to increase their theatre utilization. So they went when they worked with Amazon to do it, and so they gathered a whole heap of visual back end stuff. They gathered a whole heap of data about the patients. Then they started using predictive analytics driven by the AI engines to try and predict how long the surgeries would take. And if they could predict it more accurately, then they could schedule them quicker. And they moved the OR utilization from 80, 83% to 97%. So one, 20% more patients going through, the, going through surgery. Pretty big deal. All of that back end scheduling stuff, when you actually schedule a patient, the AI would say you're going to need X number of minutes for this patient. That's our that's our estimate. But then actually, the surgeons can go, no, no, it's going to be the case for this patient. Oh, this patient's going to be different. You get less or more. So you actually you you actually have to come back and build that into the booking system and say, well, you know, you, the AI thinks it'll take this long. Do you accept that, or you have a reason to change? It? So there's that the interaction between the two. But then because they were shifting. 20% more patients through the OR, they didn't have enough beds. So what are they going to do? They actually, what they do is they give the patient an iPad, if it saves them so much money, they, they give the patient an iPad and the iPad is linked up to all the devices on their body and they go home fully wired and the iPad is part of the hospital information system. So they're at home, but they're in, still in the hospital. And, and then they use AI mm -hmm. to watch the patients at home. And they have traveling teams that are prioritized by the AI but also the AI can ask the patient, right? The AI can communicate directly with the patient and say, is there a problem here? Or, you know, is something totally unrelated that explains what's going on? And so again, you've got the back end AI driving the mobile teams that are visiting patients that are in the hospital in their own bed, or, but you're also interacting with the patient and their care while you're doing that. Right? So that, that's in production today. But the frustration there is that the ratio of that thinking uh, happening for all those knots from home to hospital, from all these weird, all this stuff like so. The, the fire might be helpful there to reduce that frustration that we are playing with the standards. Well, all of those in that particular case, all of the at home part is all fire mediated, and we work with them. What, what kind of interaction do you need? We should have them all, and then it turned out that we do have them all now. We're going to work from memory. Um, but you know, it's just, this is how you use the web and anybody else would use the web for the same thing. So, you know, I mean, if you want, I can show you the actual, you know, where we actually have the specs, but um, in the end, it's just using the web to link everything up and using information standards on top of it. So I might, um, might just wrap it up there. We've ended up um, talking as much as we thought we would. But we started very early, so that's great. Look, can I just get everyone please to thank very much, Graham. Um, and thank you all for your attendance. I'm just going to hand over to Helene, it's just going to say a few last words. Too. So, thank you very much to um, Graham and to our speakers. Um, I think many of us who've worked in anywhere near this area know it's been a problem, and very rarely has it ever been an infrastructure or a technology problem, right from the whole concept that we really haven't touched the surface around the ethical implications of this. One of the CEOs said to me recently, this is a wonderful, I can have an, an algorithm and an AI platform that tells me that Mrs. Bloggs has just come into my emergency department, has got a 99% chance of not surviving before she leaves. Do I just put her in a corner, make a palliative and that's it? Because the algorithm's told me that. What is the ethical implications of all of the information data, data overload that we're going to get? And he said, most of my frontline workforce the first year, the second year, medical students, how are they possibly going to cope with all this? So there's all sorts of complexities I think we just haven't even touched the, the surface on. Um, I think the biggest challenge though is a lot of it is about collaboration and about interdisciplinary communication and about genuine desire for good. And clearly a lot of what we've heard about tonight is about pushing the boundaries around that basic fundamental principle, which should underpin health and um, corporate advancement of financial betterment of individuals and companies probably should have very little to do with that. 
So that was one of the big inspiring take homes for me tonight, that it was about better patient outcomes and greater public good. Um, I want to thank Chris because he has been the driving force behind a lot of this. Um, I think the collaboration across IT, business and medicine, nursing and health sciences is um, a bit unprecedented. We just need ethics and a whole lot of others um, in there as well and we'll be getting where we need to go. But I really want to thank you very much, very much thank Graham for his time and um, uh, perhaps we'll have to We'll introduce some of those discussions into some of the talks we have with Minister on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> if we're brave. Um, so, can you thank me right today? Join me in thanking very much to speak. <laughs> and thank you all of our PhD group students. Go forth and do good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a pretty interesting day. I can see it. Oh, I don't really <laughs>